already. I know, I know. <laughs> that, that's the problem. You can't quite. I mean, it, now it's showing on the. We do see it, I think. Yep. We are I live. See it. We are live. I can't really tell how many people are joining us, obviously, but we'll pretend that we are being watched. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Uh, if you are uh, watching us live, uh, this is the Prague Piano webcast. And my name is David Tohos. I'm the artistic director of the Prague Piano Festival. Uh, I'm here with you know, uh, Jihei Song, who is my co-moderator, a great pianist. You know, who those of you who have been watching us you know, already know pretty well. And I would like to introduce our friend and colleague, uh, the pianist Lisa Stefanova. Uh, and what to say about her, uh, <laughs> despite her fairly young age she's an immensely accomplished artist already she is um, active as soloist as a chamber musician she collaborates with important vocalists she has played you know in the great halls in the world she's played in the great festivals uh, in Europe and America and she's also an associate professor of piano at the University of Georgia in Athens and she built there a wonderful studio of uh, students over the years uh, uh, her husband you know is a great violinist she is a small child so we're all gonna, gonna ask you later in the program, you know, how you manage all of them. <laughs> when you sleep. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, but but maybe maybe we, we can we can start from the beginning because I think it's always always a good place uh, place to start. And uh, you were born in Belarus. Uh, you uh, lived in Germany for about ten years. Is that is that correct or longer? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, pretty much. Then you then, then you came to America. So you studied at, at the Hans Eisler Academy in Berlin. Then you went to Juilliard, where you did, did your master's and, and doctoral degree. So I'm just wondering, you know, if you could kind of introduce us to you, and if you could talk a little bit about your musical upbringing, your studies in Germany, your move to the U.S. Um, sure. So I started piano at the tender age of four. Uh, I can't say that I started it very seriously, but very enthusiastically. Um, I always tell the story that my grandma had bought at the flea market a really beautiful upright piano with candle holders and a Mozart <laughs> carving in the middle. I mean, it's really fairy tale piano. Um, and despite having a relative who was an accomplished violinist to whom I was introduced, you know, to see whether maybe I should play violin, I insisted that no, pian piano is my instrument. <laughs> so, and I started first at four in a kind of like a music club, kind of like a community center. Um, in the smaller town where my grandma was and then I went to a music school just a regular also kind of community music school at six and then at age nine I transferred to um, one of those special music schools that was attached to the conservatory so kind of like a much more serious pre-professional kind of training ground uh, where some kids were from. Um, so I was living in Belarus at that time. My grandma was in Russia, but I was living in Belarus and um, kids were from all over Belarus um, because this was the one central music school in the capital. So I was there from the age of nine to 13. And it was kind of the, the kind of rigorous, you know, early childhood training that you would imagine, you know, lots of scale exams and, uh, and things like that. And I, I that's sort of where I kind of, I think, built the foundations for my technique, I would say, and, and other things as well. I'm very grateful to my teacher there, even though I was very scared of her, but I'm very grateful to her. So, um, and then my family moved to Germany when I was 13 because my parents are scientists and they started research positions there. And there I also went to a special music school in East Berlin, which was kind of after the, I mean, it was no longer Soviet at, at any of those points, but um, it was also modeled kind of after the Soviet uh, model of the special music school, central music school. So I did that. That was pretty much all, all my high school. And I studied from the age of 15. I, I worked first from 13 to 15. I worked with a really um, interesting young German professor. His name was Gerald Faut. He is now um, a very kind of distinguished professor in, in Leipzig. And he was one of the winners of the Bach competition. Uh, he was really young, I think in his 30s when I worked with him for two years. 
Uh, but that was really um, an interesting experience for me. And then from the age of 15, I studied for almost 10 years with the same person, um, <clears throat> a Hungarian Romanian Jewish um, professor by the name of Georg Sava, who was really my formative teacher. Um, and um, in, in many ways, just kind of in the outlook on the profession and the way I approach repertoire and what pianists I like listening to in just many, many ways. So I, I studied with him most of high school and then also all of my undergrad. I then just transitioned kind of seamlessly. I don't even know if we needed to play an exam. I don't remember, but I sort of seamlessly transitioned into the um, Hochschule. So the conservatory in Berlin. And then um, my parents actually moved to the States already when I was in high school. And I was I was actually not particularly a rebellious teenager, but I, I did make it clear to them that it's kind of like enough, the country hopping. <laughs> and I'm just going to stay in Germany because it's nice here and I have my friends. And you guys can just kind of, you know, you can move on. <laughs> I hope my mom's not watching. Uh, no, they were very kind and they made that possible, even though that seems, you know, now that I have a child, that seems uh, intense actually, but my mom stayed with me until I finished high school and then she joined my dad in the States. So I did my undergrad there by myself. And then uh, after I was finished with that, I was ready to move on. And then um, I started applying to schools in the States. Um, and um, I played some successful auditions and I, I chose Juilliard because I enjoyed my lesson with Jerome Lowenthal and also because I just kind of thought that, you know, I'm coming for my graduate studies. I don't know anybody in the U.S. I don't know what the profession's like. So, you know, if I go to school in a kind of a very central place, um, I will probably kind of catch on. And that's that's kind of what happened. You know, I was thrown into New York. The dorm was a shock. <laughs> after spacious European apartments. Uh, no, but it, I, I learned a lot both from Lowenthal and my two subsequent teachers at Juilliard. Um, I kind of sort of transitioned and shared teachers at various points. There was no, um, uh, I mean, one of them passed away, Seymour Lipkin, but I'm in, in, in good relationships with uh, both Mr. Lowenthal and also um, Joseph Kalbstein, who was my final teacher there. So. Um, that's pretty much the story of my studies. So yeah, and then Juilliard, I did master's and then I also stayed on for DMA because um, master's is short and I I felt like I knew what, what I was getting there and I liked it. Um, I found actually, I don't know if my, my experience at Juilliard was particularly typical. I don't know. What was interesting for me at Juilliard was that it was actually a versatile place and more versatile than, you know, maybe I, I sort of, with no information, but just kind of intuition thought at first it would be. I thought it would just be kind of a conservatory, but um, I did a lot of fellowships there. I did a lot of community work um, there, actually through the Office of Community Outreach. Mm -hmm. um, I taught, I held sort of teaching fellowships in all kinds of classes and academic uh, departments. So I actually really feel like I got a very well-rounded um, experience there despite you know, maybe some anecdotes about the school that they're based more on the mm -hmm. pre, uh, maybe Joseph Polisi era. I mean, Joseph Polisi, the president who was there for right. 25 years, um, I think it was very much his goal to make it a more well-rounded school. So, and, and, and that um, was true for me. So that's that's pretty much my experience. Oh, this this was great. I mean, I have I think we have so many questions, but I thought you know maybe <laughs> yeah. before, before we before we ask questions, maybe we should play some music because it's always nice, you know, so, so I think uh, uh, when, when, when I spoke to Lisa a couple of days ago, we talked about the playlist for this webcast, you know, and she suggested the, the, the Brahms Sonata, uh, and maybe uh, we're going to play the, the last moment, maybe, maybe you can tell us a little bit about, you know, why this piece, you know, is it, is it close to your heart and why? Um, sure. So first of all, I, uh, when you asked, um, and by the way, thank you so much for having me, both of you. <laughs> it's really nice to see both of you and your wonderful friends and colleagues. And it's kind of nice to spend this evening with you. Um, so when you asked, I thought, you know, I would like uh, a recording that's recent. So, so this is the recording from my last solo recital, which was in February, you know, before uh, my, my last in-person so <laughs> solo <laughs> recital. Um, you know, bef before so much has changed. Uh, so, um, and that program was kind of, um, I often play thematic programs, but that one really wasn't. I just wanted to play certain pieces, and so I did. 
I hadn't played the Brahms in about 10 years. Um, I've had a few students play it, so it was kind of fresh and, you know, I was kind of working with students who, I had two students recently played, both of them very talented. And um, I kind of thought, yeah, you know, I really feel like diving into that piece again. Um, um, I also sometimes feel like uh, from my studies or something, I have some loose ends with pieces where, you know, I don't know, I played this one for my doc one of my doctoral recitals and the last movement was not as good as the first movement. I think we, all, I, we all sympathize. <laughs> so, so I kind of enjoy sometimes picking out pieces where I feel like I have some loose ends and it was a really um, nice journey. Also, I play a lot of music that is inspired by something tangible like i play a lot of music that's inspired by art or or literature so i actually hadn't played that much um more abstract music in a while so um it was kind of nice to to you know look at this you know long five movements i mean yes the second movement is based on a song and you know if, if one really wanted to one could find you know threads and connections but never really overt so it was kind of nice to to get back to this piece. Great. So we're going to hear the last movement of the Brahms of minus nine.
was awesome. That was a little, a little too exciting. <laughs> I, I made it. This was actually one of my first doctorate recital piece. Yeah. Say. And it was so hard. And I never played it again. <laughs> and now I want to play it again. Well, look, loose ends. You know, that's how it happens. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's what happens, yeah. Or just you know, listening to your playing, you know, and I always uh, wonder, you know, when I when I hear a pianist, uh, you know, pianist I know well, you know, I kind of like talking about about schools, you know, about pianistic schools, you know, about pianistic traditions, you know, and I'm just you know wondering, of course, you know, listening to you, you know, you had, of course, you know, your childhood, you know, in in Belarus, you know, so of course you are the product of the Russian school, then going to Germany where you had you know German teachers, you know, so you were kind of exposed to like completely different aesthetics in a way, you know, and then coming to America, which must have been a very different experience working with uh, Mr. Lamenthal. Uh, do you consider yourself being a Russian pianist? I really don't know. You don't really know. I, it's, it's, a, it's a mix, just like my accent is a mix. You know, it's, it's a mix. Um, there are some things... Um, I don't know. I mean, some things came full circle, sort of some things... Um, I had to get or I got rid of certain aspects of my playing in Germany for better or for worse and they came back in the US like I think well, what, certain, what kind of aspects I'm, I'm just curious certain yeah. amount of freedom um, I don't I don't really know I mean it's hard to say you know I'm, I'm in it so the <laughs> uh, phrase actually I have a question about when you were talking about the pre-college experience you know the vigorous mm -hmm. procedure sort of so to say, to go to, and I went through arts middle school and arts high school. There were mm -hmm. things placed upon me to do, right? You know, mm -hmm. middles and etudes, and every semester you have to do certain things. But then, at, after I graduated, and now I'm a teacher, thinking back, you know, I did those things, but nobody told me how to do those things. You know what I mean? My teachers would talk about musical things know, or a little faster here, or slower there, and maybe some things about practice, a little bit with little bit variations or whatever. But actually, I don't remember anyone telling me um, the actual technical stuff, like how mm. to play the piano, so to say. I think it's partially because they thought I was doing fine. Mm. So they just let it be. But then it was just much later that someone would tell me, this is how you move your body, kind of, or this is how technique works. So I am very indebted to, that was Evelyn Bronckhart back in mm -hmm. um, right. Indiana. Just one semester with her made me think about a lot of things. So then I'm wondering, you know, when you do the technical regimen, skills and arpeggios, is there a specific way that a certain teacher told you to do that was very influential or like, how do you approach the technical aspect as a teacher and as a... Oh, that's, I mean, those are, yeah, th those are very good questions. I think there's se several sort of separate questions there, sort of what I, I try to disentangle what was my experience um, from what I'm seeing in my students, because, you know, I, I, I want to respond to something that I'm actually seeing in my students and that I want, that I also see work mm -hmm. when I tell them. So I did, you know, definitely in, in Russia as, as well as with um, my German teacher, as well as actually Mr. Kallenstein to, to, to some degree. Um, I mean, people, people did give me, you know, good technical advice. I didn't always listen, but, they, but it was given. <laughs> so, uh, so I definitely think that, um, you know, nowadays, I don't know, I'm entering like a different stage in my life or something. I'm finding myself more tense sometimes, or it looks tense, but actually there's something fundamentally actually not tense, I think, in my playing, which I have benefited from greatly. And I think that that was kind of the drop technique that I learned um, in, in Russia. So I think um, there's some, I mean, you know, there's, there's some superficial tension sort of here, but there's not a lot of superficial tension kind of, not superficial tension, but tension kind of in the back and in the shoulders. So I do use my arms. So I've, I would credit that with, I've been lucky that I've never been particularly injured. I mean, I, I broke my fingers once, but that, that wasn't the fault of bad technique. So, so uh, that's a separate story. Um, and then I think my German teacher, so my, my 
Russian teacher didn't focus as much on how to connect sort of in a circular way, how to connect phrases kind of with the wrist, particularly she was not very into wrist in general. She didn't talk about it very much. She talked more about the larger muscles and then kind of this circular thing I learned more from my German teacher, which I thought was also helpful. And I, um, there are some things that I've learned also f from just listening to master classes. Actually, I, I, I love having people for master classes at UG. I know, you know, people are different, but, but I love it. You know, I'm sitting there and I take notes. I mean, um, David gave a master class a couple months ago and I took notes about how to, you know, the quality of the left hand and <laughs> you know, various other things that he told my students. Um, so there are some things, um, particularly things that I haven't um, suffered from in a while. I need to hear other people talk about more, if that makes sense. There, I mean, I'm not saying that everything's right with me. There are things that I'm suffering from right now. And those are things that are very acutely on my mind. And if I hear them in my students, I'm like, oh yeah, that's the same thing. But there's some things that, that I haven't, um, I have an average size hand. I've now taught a few people with a particularly small hand. So I've thought even more about, you know, how do you not stretch? I don't know if that answers your question at all, but that's- Oh no, yeah, it's something about the mix about the drop and then, you know, the circular motion or to use the arm and wrist. Because again, when I think back up to my college, nobody told me anything about these things. Because I could play a lot of things, I think, just fine. I don't know how I did it either. But, you know, when the piece has to be fast, I was doing it fine. Uh, so anyways, the first person who said anything about how to move anything was in college, but it just didn't work that well for me but then uh Bronckhardt talked about the support of the knuckles oh yeah that was totally new to me but it, it's such an important concept and then now i'm thinking how come nobody told me about that until that point the mm -hmm. how the structure hand structure is supported a lot there and then um something about how to sit or how you use your upper arm things like that that came actually pretty late for me. Mm -hmm. And um, my teacher, Mr. Auer, Edward Auer, would just tell me to be more relaxed in the shoulder area. That mm -hmm. I remember he physically, that was the one thing that he told me often enough that it, I still remember it. But it was just fascinating to me to realize it after the fact that like, wait a minute, I did all those skill arpeggio etudes like crazy but I don't actually know how I got there. So I was just curious. So I'm curious about, so it, it, this doesn't quite sound like my experience. Uh, so the question, my, my question would be, um, so but a lot of these things were working for you already in college because you obviously, you know, got into a very good college and, and all of those things. So so then it's it's more like a pedagogical or a maintenance in, in interest that you're more interested in understanding how your own body works. I think that, so. that's that's quite different from retraining i mean i've also gone through some i mean definitely with my at nine years old it was retraining maybe that's also why i remember it so well because it wasn't from you know four years old it was when i came to the special music school she told me you know very clearly that everything is wrong <laughs> and then and then she i mean uh, uh well i mean and, and she she was right it's it was i don't know if it was wrong but it was it was insufficient and it was clueless and it was not organized and then she told me very clearly, you know, what things needed to look like. And so I've noticed that sometimes people who have gone through retraining at some point in their lives um, can pass it on really well. So maybe you're one of the lucky ones who did everything right from, <laughs> from you know, yeah, baby and steps. I, and, and I think you know, some, people, some, people, some people did, you know, that's the thing, because I remember, you know, my first first really good piano teacher I really admired and I learned a lot from, you know, and one day I would ask him a question about fingerings and he would kind of, you know, sit there in his chair, like smoking, of course, and he would, like, he, and he, and he would you know, say, like, play with your nose, I don't care, it just needs to, needs to sound good, mm. you know, and which is a good point, but I really wonder, you know, how many of the old school, old school pianists actually taught this way. You right. Know, and, maybe, and maybe, you know, what we learned from them was somehow the sound, because we are listening to the sound or we're, we're trying to imitate the sound. And there was the body language also, you know, which we mm -hmm. maybe, you know, somehow incorporated, you know, as we were right. you know, learning and watching them. So maybe, maybe not everything needs to be said, you know, because I think, you know, especially in America, people try to overanalyze everything. You know, I think that the culture kind of, you know, is super analytical and tends to sort of, you know, talk about every, you know, 
every kind of you know inch of your of your body you know sometimes you know people overthink things too much right so yeah. that's true i mean i think there's definitely a lot and kind of just the power of personality it's sort of like you mm -hmm. know conductors vary in how they rehearse you know some people just kind of it's just an aura, you know, and everybody plays better, you know, all these right, anecdotes, right. Uh, you know, F Fort Wangler e enters the room and the symphony already sounds better, even though he's not at the podium yet. Yeah. So, so there's definitely some of that. Um, I guess I've, um, I've become ever more interested in this with my students, hmm. you know, um, partially sometimes because I see a few more injuries than I was aware of and sometimes or most of the time people come and they've already been injured in the past mm -hmm. um, and then also because uh, you know particularly with very talented students when you see that what's happening here is just not bringing out what like all this stuff inside so then then um, and the stuff inside is there you know my personality or not my personality but but it's the execution is not mm -hmm. is not up to the same level so that's why um, I've been on totally a journey as a teacher, just trying to help. And I think we, we all were, you know, we, we discussed this with Jihei, you know, er, earlier, you know, the fact that, you know, in, in America, uh, in, in the States especially, you know, you get wonderful students, but you had also really bad students. Not bad students, but, you know, students, you know, who were taught consistently so badly for years <laughs> and years and years and years, you know, and that's something that, that, you know, wouldn't have quite happened, you know, say in, in Russia or, or in Europe, you know, where the education or in Asia, course you know where the education is a little bit more streamlined so it's not that everybody is great but you don't really have terrible teachers you know because everybody was kind of taught by the by the good by the good teachers you know and, and somehow you know we find ourselves you know in a very different environment as teachers you know in, in in the US and where we have students you know who we have to basically like rebuild you know we have to teach them you know how to walk again and what maybe I've, that's something yeah oh, sorry. no 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 that's uh, that that makes sense I mean what I've also been kind of on a learning curve, you know, coming from New York, you know, um, where it was just that Juilliard building and not much, much else and moving to Georgia and meeting a lot of teachers here. Mm -hmm. And also now I have one <laughs> private student. Mm -hmm. uh, before that, I didn't really have time. What I'm just finding is that um, there's so much college prep anxiety in students. And I think students just decide later that they want to go into music. And I think that private teachers and I think they're right in doing so have to be very careful kind of working around the students other interests because I think very many private private teachers just don't know whether that student's going to go professionally into music so I, I find that very very tricky you know um, and kind of my philosophy is that you know I'm there to help the students goals but what if the students goals are really versatile and the student you know might go into med school or something so so then certain things um like I, I was always very puzzled by how short the repertoire was for all the mm -hmm. local pre-college competitions yeah. you know i mean my repertoire you know competition at age 16 two hours plus concerto <laughs> i mean like, that's just that was a given you know and, and here it's you know a whole year one movement of sonata and then one other piece and, and, you know, I, I came into this sort of very smug, you know, kind of, well, you know, what are they doing? Somebody just needs to tell them that they should assign the whole sonata. And then I realized that just kind of systemically, because there aren't that many special music schools, there aren't that many performance opportunities, there aren't that many students learn very individually. Some, some teachers are able to have a studio culture where everybody's serious, but many teachers will have, you know, a very varied studio where only one or two students are really serious and it's, uh, it's not really the teacher's um choice i mean it's just sort of how how it is does that make any sense to you david I, yes yeah mm -hmm. I, the, I think the size of the country and then the culture that is different from state to state and then not having a lot of specialized arts schools. you know number mm -hmm. one I think per capita i think it's very small and even the art schools that exist, it's not the same kind of structure or vigor as the art schools that I am used to in, in Korea. Mm -hmm. So I think definitely the interest level is different and the moment when they decide to pursue it very seriously, it's very That's different. Right. Yeah, I think it's much earlier in other yes. countries. I mean, uh nobody asked me at nine whether I was going to be a musician like of course that otherwise you know what am I doing at that school I'm taking somebody else's yeah. spot you know <laughs> so 
So that was, um, I what? mean, there, there are pros and cons to, to, to everything. True. And especially the music field is changing so much, especially in the States where I think versatility is becoming so important. Um, yeah, there, there are trade-offs and students tend to be right. very mature in other ways. So. so I think we should talk about versatility now because uh, <laughs> as I mentioned earlier, and you're very versatile pianist artist you know you have so many different projects going you know and i really, really like the way you know one project you know connects with the other you know and there's always you know such a you know strong philosophy behind behind each and so maybe maybe i can just ask a more general question you know you of course you know you, you play you play Sorry. a lot of you play a lot of solo repertoire uh you're you're involved with singers a lot of for, for for many years you know i think that's, that's right. I, from what i understand mm -hmm. i think that's a, that's that's a big passion of yours uh, you have a you have a trio. You have had a trio for ten years. You're celebrating ten years right mm -hmm. now. So uh, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about about that. You know how actually not focusing just on your solo career, but actually you know exploring you know, all these other mediums, especially the, the the singers. I'm really interested you know in that. You know how do you think that enriched or helped you grow as a, as, a, as a pianist as a musician? So um, a lot of this is just, you know, kind of my, my personality and it's hard for me to kind of trace, you know, it's not like I, I ever made a choice. At some point they started making choices that, that out of those 10 things that I've tried, like that 10 thing I don't want to do, <laughs> but the other nine I still do. <laughs> so like at some point it was more like, so I've kind of tried, tried everything. A lot of it was accidental. My, um, my singer collaboration career be was because, um, the person I was sat next to when I came to Germany and spoke no um, German was a classmate who spoke both Russian and German, and she what? became an opera singer. And she's my best friend, or one of my my best friends. So, um, and she transitioned from being a pianist to being a singer, and I was her accompanist. And then I was her accompanist in um, in conservatory, and then I. We entered, um, I was very influenced by a man in Berlin by the name of Wolfram Rieger. He's one of, I mean, I studied with him for two years. He had a lead class where you could, uh, so art song course where you could just audition with a partner. So sing a pianist duo and you could just focus on, I don't know, French songs for a semester. So it wasn't a degree, but it, it was kind of like a really cool club of art song um, enthusiasts. And I think he's a tremendous musician. Um, so I, I learned with, with just so much imagination, um, particularly derived from images and the text. So I learned a lot from him um, and I went there f with my friend. Um, then um, my friend started taking lessons with Fischer Disco's wife, who had kind of like an also kind of an opera studio, not really her own teaching studio, but kind of like an advanced opera course. So then I started playing for her 10 to 1 on Wednesdays. Um, and then at that point, Fischer Disco really didn't want to deal with, I think, often kind of auditioning people, especially pianists, mm. for his master classes. So he asked, you know, his wife who was playing for your studio. And there was me and a couple other people. Mm. So we started going to his master classes and like sort of involved master classes, like, you know, two weeks in a village where Hugo Wolf was born in Austria, <laughs> you know, where we would have, you know, breakfast, lunch and dinner with them, uh, with Disco and his wife, and he would just kind of, kind of talk really off the cuff. Um, so the master classes were always a lot more performative, but the, the off the cuff, you know, in the lunches and dinners was a lot more free. Mm. And then he had kind of like a visiting distinguished super something position at uh, the University of Arts, um, which was the other conservatory in Berlin. And the way he would run his masterclass there would be that we would go to his house like three times a week for the whole month of January. And then there was one week of sort of more performative again, masterclass in February. So that was also, you know, he was just um, about 80 at that time and kind of just looking back at a lot of things. So there was, um, I don't actually, I will be completely honest. I mean, I, I took notes and I saved those scores. I don't remember as much of what he said as, as I remember what Riga said. So I consider him more of a teacher, but still, you know, being close to disco and kind of in that aura was big for me. Um, and then I came to New York and I started sort of playing with singers. And then I saw a poster for Songfest um, at Juilliard and I thought, well, you know, that's kind of like a hobby of mine. I'd like to apply. And then I went there and it turned out to be the super rigorous, you know, one month thing where I played like 80 songs. 
<laughs> and then I slowly discovered that me speaking German, German is my second language after Russian, so English is my third, that me speaking Russian and German was actually quite quite an asset in working with singers. I, I didn't know much about IPA, the International Phonetic Alphabet, mm. but I could hear when the pronunciation was not right. And I, I can coach, I can still coach easily, you know, Russian and German without as much preparation as maybe some other people need. Mm. Although I've also learned how to prepare. Then I started going to Songfest, you know, first as a student, like kind of a fellow, and then as a kind of a, I don't know, something, staff piano, something, and then as a faculty, and then as associate artistic director, and now back at facu as faculty. Um, and that was, so Songfest has been a really huge experience for me in various ways, not just because of, um, singers and art song, which I love, and everything that I've learned from Martin Katz and Graham Johnson there and Margot Garrett um, and a lot of other wonderful people, um, but particularly maybe those three. Um, but it was also um, the director of it, Rosemary Ritter, who is um, who, who founded the thing 25 years ago. She's become really a mentor and she was the first person to kind of give me free hand, really some point I mean at some point she decided I was like trustworthy or I was doing good work and she just would let me run with the project and that was really amazing actually like that kind of trust so now a lot of what I do when I go to Songfest is that I just she just lets me run with the project like I've been doing now for five years this project called Recovered Voices uh, which is the foundation by James Conlon started by James Conlon the conductor and a few other prominent researchers actually, primarily um, dedicated to music that was sort of um, neglected, I'd say, or didn't get its due after World War II. Music that was in some cases wildly successful in like 1935 and then completely unknown in 1955. And Conlon is dedicated to sort of reviving it. So I've curated, sort of researched and conceptualized several programs. And this summer I did a particularly big project uh, because of COVID where I, you know, interviewed Conlon for an hour and I interviewed some of those other researchers, you know, one in London and one in, or somewhere in England and one in Canada and one in New York. And I sort of put it all together. Um, so, I mean, it, it's um, parts of it are not necessarily song specific. Mm. Parts of it are just about the satisfaction of seeing such a big project. Um, come to fruition with the resources of a festival that that has um, a name and a reputation and is high level. So that's been really huge for me in, in just various ways. So what about the musically and pianistically? I'm kind of you know, curious, you know, because you have, of course, you know, play a lot of repertoire, a lot of different styles. And that's kind of what happens, right? And when we play these leader recitals, we sometimes like jump, you know, from one thing to the, to, to the next. Uh, do you think that was particularly helpful to you when you were going back and doing, say, solo recitals? I mean, what do you, what do you, what have you learned from that? Yeah, that? I mean, so what I learned from Riga, really, but then, then also, a lot, I mean, other people also talk about it. But what I learned from him is, um, and I'm, I'm not saying that you know I'm super successful in this all the time in my solo repertoire, but that's kind of the idea, and that's the goal is to try to conjure up an atmosphere that's almost like cinematic so um that you play the words you know so you know what does this and, and not in a silly way like you know like a, a bird sings trick trick you know <laughs> like not not so much in that but but in, in in many different ways like what color like how um so connecting colors and touch and and all kinds of things to actually very specific images you know and that's something that um, proved really um, powerful for me. And that's why, you know, as, as I said before, I, I tend to gravitate more towards repertoire that like has a name mm -hmm. rather than just sonata um, <clears throat> with some notable exceptions. But um, yeah, so that this kind of sometimes when I just kind of get tired or something, it just gives me the, a spark of imagination. I, I've uh, I've learned to love poetry. I don't necessarily read as much poetry, just kind of on a regular basis yeah. as as maybe I should. But when I encounter it in song, I find it very powerful, mm -hmm. especially in my native languages, like in Russian and German. You know, song can make me cry like nothing else. <laughs> mm -hmm. So um, I, I also speak a little bit other languages. You know, I speak a little bit of Spanish, a little bit of French, just enough to kind of again feel the poetry with a, a little bit of dictionary help. 
Um, so yeah, it's it's mostly that I would say it spark it sparks my imagination in really powerful ways. So then, would you say that that is how you do you know your projects? The video that I watched it's beautiful. I love that rain. What's it called? Um, rain outside the church. Yes, yes, that's beautiful. And your recital at the National Sawdust also mm -hmm. had to do with the images, right? There mm -hmm. were. I will actually play this in a second. So yeah. So is that related? How you are, you know? Yeah. So um, some of the kind of music and other arts um, was an idea that was part of an ensemble that I had in New York for two years called Song Fusion. So some of it's sort of the kind of this just kind of awareness that that's a possibility. And I curated um, several programs for that ensemble. So sort of most programs were curated either by me or by um, the other pianist in the group, Kathleen Tag, from whom I actually also learned a lot. So um, some of it sort of the po uh, the possibilities were outlined a little bit in that ensemble. But I think the satisfaction that I derive from it is mm -hmm. something that I think goes back to the song. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, I definitely like music plus like in whatever way <laughs> very much so let's talk about tones and colors about about <laughs> about your C because you know we should maybe we should, we should just you know play 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 some music and and then talk afterwards sure did you do you, you want to say 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 a word you know about about the, about the fanny Mendelssohn piece or oh sure so um uh it may it may be longer than a word i'm sorry i'm a little wordy but, <laughs> but so this okay. is uh from fanny Mendelssohn's the year um, this is actually a re connected to a research project that I did at my doctorate. My doctoral thesis is actually about Felix Mendelssohn. And I got a grant to go back to Germany and do some research. And it was around the year of the two Mendelssohns. Um, and 2000, yeah. So, and then I, when I did that research, I became aware of the um, illustrated manuscript to the year. So the year is, is, is a, is a, pretty significant, important work by Fanny. It's about an hour and it's an early, I think it's, I mean, it's definitely earlier than Tchaikovsky and it might be the earliest um, cycle of all the months of the year. And there's some really significant music in it and her husband was an artist. So you, what you will see in this video is you'll see the illustrated manuscript. And I particularly like this month, September because the way he did it is, is sort of like a picture of a woman who is sitting at the river because it's called September at the river and the water flows into the 16th notes so it's so visually precious i find it really nice very romantic let's listen to it
That's a beautiful, she's a beautiful woman. Um, sorry, I just realized I was not muted. Oh, this one. <laughs> you didn't say anything, I didn't hear anything. You're I was very, kind very of quiet. moving around. <laughs> um, that, is a, that is a beautiful piece, actually. So yeah. I, mm -hmm. I played the whole Das Jahr twice. Once mm -hmm. in, in, in Berlin at the end of that summer when I was doing mm -hmm. research there at the actually former Mendel Mendelssohn, I think maybe that's where their bank was or something like that and then I played it at Juilliard once um, ne and ever since it's a really big undertaking yeah. it took me a long time but um, it's it's a beautiful piece of music yeah. so how difficult is the music like um, pianistically no? is it is it challenging it's really uncomfortable mm -hmm. in it's uh, actually really uh, so this is one of the more straightforward pieces some of the other pieces mm -hmm. have you know it really interesting kind of fits and starts on them mm -hmm. um, interestingly just like I feel with Clara Schumann it almost feels like it's for a bigger hand than some of the writing by their male family members, which is so interesting. Mm -hmm. um, Clara Schumann also always, you know, uh. so big. I don't know if she had really big hands, but... Um, yeah. And the same for Fanny Mendelssohn. I find Mendelssohn's, I mean, Mendelssohn's music is so pianistic, F Felix. What? And Fanny, I find more um, challenging, actually, in some, in some ways. In, yeah. in, that, in that cycle, you know, in particular. Mm. <clears throat> and I really find it you know, appealing, of course, you know, your interest in unusual repertoire. Maybe we should talk about new music, you know, because that's also something that, you know, you, you do a lot and you actually have two CDs out, you know, almost, almost, you know, at, at, this, at the same time, you know, one uh, with, with your trio and one, one a solo piece. And so may, maybe, maybe we could just ask you uh, for overall, why do you think it's important to play new music? Why do you think it's important to do that? Because I still sometimes, you know, have uh, conversations with, with my students, you know, and it's really hard to actually make them understand, you know, why it's such a vital undertaking, you know, for, for a musician today to actually not ignore the music that's been written in the past hundred years. I feel funny talking to, to the two of you about this because, <laughs> I mean, G is at the forefront of you know collaborations with composers and you well, play that you're, really you're wonderful for viewers you know who still might need some persuading so <laughs> no. and you played that really wonderful very member memorable piece by um a composer from fsu who passed away your result uh, yeah yeah, yeah that was really beautiful um why why is it important um <laughs> why is it important to you i mean it's really high quality music i mean i i think so one thing that I find sometimes is when people, stu whether it's students or, or, or people actually non-musicians, when they say they don't like something is because I think uh, they don't differentiate enough within that large category of things they think they don't like. You know, just because somebody somewhere didn't like one contemporary piece by somebody doesn't mean that all contemporary music is not good. Uh, or, or that maybe even that piece was good, but that, that all contemporary music will not um, appeal to them you know there's so much contemporary music out there of, of, of all kinds you know of things that stimulate your, your your brain your heart your fingers all three um, you know so I think number one is just there's lots of great music out there number two it's being written today by people who are experiencing what we are experiencing you know so um, it's relevant but it's it's also um, a little bit more from the same standpoint i mean you know when we look back I, i've been thinking about this a, a lot for various reasons you know especially now you know what should we be playing so you know it's almost becoming harder to justify these days why we should play the pieces written 500 years ago than it is to justify why, why should we should play pieces written today and i think we need to try ever harder to explain you know especially you know there's so much conversation now should we be playing beethoven and his you know 250th anniversary year and, you know, I think we need to dig deep and just kind of justify kind of the shared humanity that we share also with Beethoven, you know, as a reason to play his music. But, you know, I think there's much less justification that needs to be done for the music of today. Um, yeah, and just kind of all of the above. <laughs> and also the composers are right there, you know, it's so interesting, you know, you meet them and they're such, you know, personalities and then you can you can talk to them and what they care about and then if you're lucky they write a piece for you and then it's like you know Christmas coming up so it's sort of like this Christmas present that arrives and you think oh what's the piece gonna be like you know it's so exciting 
So it's just the... How do you pick the composers? You know, the problem I have with myself or if a student asks, there are actually too many to choose from. Just That's so true. many amazing composers, right? So how do you make your choice? How did you pick the pieces that you could? I know that the solo CD has an immigration as a mm -hmm. with the composers, but could you just talk about how you... you yeah, know? that's a... That's a really good question. I mean, that's exactly the question to ask because you don't really have like a textbook. Yeah. Um, so, you know, first of all, I think you start by and you should play the pieces by people you know. Mm -hmm. And I think for students, it definitely starts by playing pieces in the school's composition program. Then in the neighboring school's composition program, I find those exchanges to be really, you know, really fruitful. Um, so I, th I think everybody should have a lot of, I mean, I'm talking now, again, not to the two of you, but to hypothetical students who might be watching. They're right here. Something. Okay. Uh, you know, I think everybody should have the experience of playing music by people they know so that the, that collaboration can, can get going. Um, then I think um, just the more curious, you know, you are, I mean, I often find, you know, I hear something and, you know, and I'm like, oh, that's really great, you know. And then seven years later, you're looking for somebody to commission, and you're thinking, right. that, was that, <laughs> that was that was so good. I mean, you know, the first composer actually from the Trio CD, the first composer we commissioned was Jakub Chupinski. He's now in the faculty at Purchase, but we knew him as I know Itamar's, my husband's sweet mate in the dorms or something. I, I, I don't, maybe 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 not, but something along those lines. And we went to. A Choreo Comp concert at Juilliard, which is um, a collaboration between the composition program and the choreographers. So choreographers work with composers on production of new new ballets. And his piece was for two harps and two guitars that were tuned a quarter tone apart. And it was awesome because it sounded like an out old out of tune harpsichord or something i mean you know like that combination of the harps and the guitars it didn't sound like harps and guitars it sounded like memory mm -hmm. and you know reminiscence and just kind of nostalgia and seriously like seven years later we were like oh yeah yeah well obviously mm -hmm. <laughs> you know so just the more you listen and and then and then you start doing research so for, for my cd for my solo cd i did kind of all of the above and then you just start kind of um, so the only thing with doing research is that sometimes, um, like somebody told me once, you don't know what you don't know, you know, you can do research, you go to the websites of the big publishers, but then you don't come across some of the people who are not with the big publishers, you know? So, so that's a, that's a drawback. And that's why I think both kind of seeking things out as well as looking at, um, you know, sort of those established people and finding people online. So we should maybe maybe listen to what the trio CD is about. Uh, sure. Uh, so of course, you know, this is something that you have been doing for over 10 years now. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe can you tell us a little bit about your trio? Because I think that seems like a very important part of who you are as, as a musician. Sure. Um, so the, the trio is important for various reasons. One is just that it's, it's an outlet for me to work with my husband. Uh, so the trio was founded um, it was kind of a long story, but I had a chamber music group with two very wonderful people that wasn't going well for various reasons. Mm -hmm. And then my husband swooped in to, to save to save us, including our grade. <laughs> so, and that's how the, in college, and that's how the, the group um, started. And then we, a wonderful cellist joined whom I, know, whom I knew from a summer festival. And then people were sort of like, well, why don't you guys do fish off? And we did fish off the first mm -hmm. year and for the application, we had to find the name. So we we came up with that name because somebody suggested that on like a day's notice. And then we did pretty well in Fischoff. And then unfortunately, that wonderful cellist had to move away. Um, and then we found the current cellist who has been so almost from the beginning, just except for that first year. Um, and then we started doing competitions, you know, really rather successfully. And we were really lucky that we started in college. So we had a lot of coachings and a lot of input, mm -hmm. a lot of performance opportunities. We went to Mexico mm -hmm. we, on a Juilliard trip and we saw the pyramids. And nice. <laughs> so, uh, so um, yeah. 
And then since then, then the last competition that we won was Concert Artist Guild, and um, they provide professional management, and they kept us on for really long, actually, until this year, since 2012. They kept us on for almost eight years, with big thanks to them. Um, and they really, especially some of the people who took care of us early on there, um, really built our career. Mm. Uh, so now we, we've joined since the spring sometime we've joined the mm. com commercial management mm -hmm. so for the cd for the anniversary cd you you chose contemporary music was that your idea was it everybody's idea was it just some kind of like a logical conclusion that you know it has to be it has to be new music well we have one cd already we had kind of like a calling card cd that we recorded as sort of part of the prize of winning cag and that was mm. You know, Ravel Trio and if, mm. and Schubert Naturno and Haydn mm. Trio and those kinds of things. So we already had a CD like that. And then um, it just so happened that we were able to either commission a few composers um, or uh, some, some people wrote something for us or we were asked to premiere something that was commissioned mm. yeah. for something else. So at some point we just had a CD's worth of music. And then I think the CD was my idea, but, but there was kind of logical trajectory to it. So let's see what it's all about. Thank you. 
Yay. So great to hear Will's piece. Yeah, Will's piece is great. Yeah. So, <clears throat> Will's piece actually was the only one that wasn't really premiered by the trio. I, I played it with two other people a while ago um, and I really enjoyed it. Um, so yeah, I'm really glad that we have it on there. So this just came out, right? Yeah. Uh, it came out on Friday. It came out on Friday. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, I, I actually, I, I managed to listen to most of these pieces. Uh, mm -hmm. And I was just, you know, so, uh, so impressed with like the breadth, you know, of different styles, uh, mm -hmm. you know, be because, because you don't always, always, you know, hear that, you know, that it's really so uh, exciting to actually, you know, hear great music, but, you know, each one, it's kind of its own world, you know, in, in, mm -hmm. in a way. And it's also what's really wonderful that, you know, you have, you know, composers of such diverse uh, backgrounds, you know, mm -hmm. people coming, you know, generationally, but also, of course, you know, people coming, you know, from different, different countries. Mm -hmm. And I know that this, this is something you have been thinking about a lot when you were putting together your, your solo CD, which is also coming out, which is, uh, so can you talk to us a little bit about App Pluribus Unum and how did that? Uh, sure. Um, so that's my second solo CD. The first one was, um, about music and visual art, that was the the mm -hmm. cover of that was in that other video, um, and this was the second one. Um, I've been working in it for three years. Um, it started because of um, a student of mine, kind of a long story, but his parents were not able to come to his graduation because he's Iranian. Um, it was in 2017, and I was just reading a lot also on on, on Facebook. You know, not just uh, you know, obviously the news. I mean, we all, we all read the news, but but also kind of personal stories like that person whom i know you know like is, is not able to come because because of this band that is so um um both discriminatory and and not discriminating um so in any case so uh, that's um, how i how this project started and i commissioned this student for for peace i also thought he was a really um, talented composer otherwise i wouldn't have done it and then I started kind of putting together a recital program around it. And I thought a little bit about myself as an immigrant. And then through all of that, you know, what I was telling Jihye about how you, of course, I don't have to tell Jihye, but you know, how you find um, pieces so that the album came together. And then I played it in San Francisco. Um, and then I wrote the grant to record the program. And it, it just took a really long time because, um, because of uh, our growing family. I, I had to laugh in that trio video about the strategically placed music stand. I was very pregnant when we were recording that. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, so that's why the the recording kind of and the editing of uh, "If Pluribus Unum, Unum" took you know three years. Um, and then somehow, I guess this year, you know, I wasn't planning. It, it it was scheduled for release in August. You know, a while ago, long while ago. The label was very organized about it. And somehow it met a moment, I think, with the election and, you know, it just, I guess, um, met some things that were on people's minds listening to it, you know, the just considering the, the policies and considering also our diversity, you know, given um, you know, the, the, the huge prominence of, of Black Lives Matter. This is not, con I mean, the CD is not connected to Black Lives Matter, but it's a kind of a similar question of, um, you know, considering us as a society and all of our diversities. So um, the CD came out and, and people have reacted really positively to it. So it's um, it's been really heartening. Yeah. And of course, you know, uh, the, the the idea behind it is, is, is so is so interesting. But of course, in the, in the individual pieces are so fantastic as well. You know? Oh, and yeah. It's, and, and it's really nice, you know, I mean, it's, it's great you know, when those two come together, because, you know, sometimes, you know, you can have uh, very political pieces that are not very good pieces. I mean, I guess that would be kind of the definition of um, to tokenism in, in, in some ways. So, right. no, I mean, every piece um, that I chose was striking and, and, and uh, personal to me. And I, I, I think they're they're all absolutely mm -hmm. fantastic. I mean, yeah. So tell us about the piece we're going to hear next. Oh, yes. So uh, this is a, a music video that uh, was made by the wonderful visual artist Kavork Murad, whom I admire a lot. Um, he was actually part of some project with that ensemble I had in New York. And that's how I first met him through our mutual friend, um, Kathleen Tag. Um, he's a Syrian American visual artist. Um, and he initially kind of 
I mean, he, he's also just a, an artist who exhibits work, but he also works with musicians. He's known for working with musicians and particularly for drawing live during a performance with some pre, sometimes with some kind of, uh, so some of parts of the artwork are already pre-done, but then he does a lot of it live in the concert. And that was part of a concert like that. He's the only visual artist in Yuriyama's Silk Project, so he's part of some really um, high profile and interesting um, things. So when I asked him to make this music video to Rinaldo Moya's Rain Outside the Church, which is a piece about an immigrant's journey from south to north. And that particular piece is about the sanctuary church. So he had this idea of sort of, first of all, a church, and then you sort of I don't know if we'll have time to watch the entire video, but um, and then kind of, you know, the, the doors open and then you sort of see the piano and then out of the piano kind of come people. And then also out of the piano kind of comes kind of a church inside the church that kind of shelters those people. So it's kind of a beautiful idea of, you know, art being sheltered. Watch it. <clears throat>
It's gorgeous, truly gorgeous. It's a great piece too. The video is beautiful, and the piece also great. Yeah, and, very and, and the integration, you know, of the sound, you know, and the and the image is just so seamlessly integrated. So you kind of you almost like stop noticing they're like two different things, you know, and that's something you rarely see. Mm -hmm. I think that's all of Kavork's kind of experience um, drawing live. You know, not just kind of making a video after the fact, but just kind of right. So we talked at the very beginning about uh, all your accomplishments and all your activities, and uh, I guess our questions, you know, we have many. But uh, Jihei was going to ask you a few, you know, because we discussed this actually before before the webcast, and it basically revolves around how do you do it all. But I think Jihei has has actually a better formulation of the question, so I'm gonna ask her. To Not ask a it. formulation, <laughs> and it's just also something of an observation, you know as a fellow musician but also a mother and you know i don't have a full-time job like you do but still it's a lot to manage and then i just remember the first time i know we are going longer but i have to mention it because the first time i met lisa was at a competition and we were judging something together and i just vividly remember and um, i just happened to see just a little bit of the comments that you were writing for for one of the students and it was just so striking to me how warm and well constructed and i don't know just it was just it struck me as oh my gosh she's saying all the great things but also in a very positive warm way and i was looking at my notes and i'm like this is wrong you have to do this <laughs> just you know <laughs> so anyways um and the quality of work that you put out there like this cd and the video and I'm sure you're a great teacher too. So then I just observe and think, oh my God, she's just really amazing. And I feel like I'm kind of lazy or not doing as much, but then, you know, we all do different things, but I just wanted you to talk about, um, not exactly like how do you do it all, but do you make a point of um, rest, resting? you know, at one point, because I don't think one can keep going with this like high quality focused kind of performing and teaching and doing work all the time. And do you make a point of stopping and um, having some family time? Like what's your strategy for that so crashing down? <laughs> so, I mean, first of all, you know, again, we're all doing it all. I mean, you're doing it all. David also has a beautiful daughter. So we're all doing all the same things, you know, the teaching and the performing and the projects and the, and the family life. So I really don't have a strategy. I probably should. I'm starting to feel like I need to develop more of a strategy. Um, I, um, I often just push myself on enthusiasm for what I'm doing and for my students. So it just kind of like, I just forge forward. I don't know. And it's sometimes really not pretty. <laughs> like somewhere <laughs> behind the scenes is not pretty. Uh, I mean, I, I am blessed with a lot of things. I'm, I'm blessed with, you know, a fantastic um, life partner, you know, who's probably holding our daughter's hand for the two hours that we've been talking. And, um, you know, and, and, and my job is uh, mostly kind of the, 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 the outlines of my job are reasonable. Um, yeah, so I think for me, motivation is a really big factor. So if if the project is sufficiently or if whatever it is that I'm doing, I try not to do anything that doesn't motivate me. And then it's sort of, you know, then it just becomes a matter of how many hours are in that day, you know. And then sometimes they're not enough or what I need to do, and then I get behind and people get angry. But, <laughs> you know, then it, it does get done in the end usually. <laughs> so... Uh, is I I came to realize it later. You know, it right. It has to mean something really a lot to you, so that you don't feel tired almost, or even if you're tired, right. do it. Right. Exactly. Be very important. Yeah, like the Marie Kondo approach for musicians. <laughs> Does it make joy or something like that? Oh uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. I didn't read the book, but I've heard about that. Yes. <laughs> Does it bring you joy? Yes. So right. what do you tell your students, you know, who, who come to lessons and who are tired and who have no ideas, you know, and who are kind of looking up to you to kind of energize them, you know, and show them the path? 
how do you talk to them about it? I'm really conflicted, actually, and I mm. try a different approach. I mean, I think it just depends on the student what you tell them. And sometimes yeah. I tell them one thing that week and then it like mm. gets worse the following week. Mm. Like, uh, you know, uh, and I don't mean the, the playing. The playing usually gets <laughs> gets better, <laughs> but the kind of kind of the outlook, you know, because, you know, a lot of us have doubts and motivation slumps. Um, yes, I'm really conflicted mm. and I just try different approaches. Um, on the one hand, I wish I could just tell students, you know, live this really beautiful, balanced life and, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and do all of those things perfectly and organize your, your day perfectly. But I've also read somewhere that sometimes this this approach can also be a trap as if like the burden is on you to organize your life in this completely perfectionist way. But mm -hmm. sometimes there is no no perfect way of dealing with the situation you're in. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the deadline is the deadline and the missed opportunity is the missed opportunity. And then the question just becomes, you know, like, yes or no, do you want to do it or not? You know, uh, and I'm also really OK with students deciding not to do something like I'm 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 very OK with it. But if they do decide to do something, then, you know, they got to do it. <laughs> so. Right. Yeah. I mean, maybe this could be my last question for you. Sure. Because, you know, you kind of know, of course, you know, you have <laughs> this like amazing, versatile uh, artistic personality. But as you said, you know, you really were trained, you know, in the Russian school, you know, so you were playing skills and arpeggios a lot so you kind of have a little bit little bit of both you know you have this kind of you know laser laser like focus on one hand you know and then of course you know the personality that allows you to explore with a lot of confidence and um, and understanding different uh, uh, different different uh, areas of music or, or art but what do you do with students you know who uh, have this kind of mind you know who are really interested you know, in exploring everything but who don't quite have the foundations, like the, the pianistic, the phys physiological foundations. Do you actually tell them, well, you know, you basically need to sit down and you need to practice six hours a day because otherwise you can have all these wonderful ideas, but basically you're not going to get anywhere if, you know, if the fingers are not working properly. How do you, how do you balance that? Right. So, I mean, I guess that's again, like a multi-pronged approach. So number one is, um, I work backwards or forwards from the students' goals. Like the thing that always worries me the most is if kind of the what is happening is not matching what the student want, wants to achieve at the end. Like that that makes me very nervous for the student because I think uh, that can lead to sort of frustration or disappointment or something. I think if the if what's happening and the goals are well aligned, whatever that may be, I think that's really great. Number two is, you know, you try to work both with the strengths and the weaknesses, mm -hmm. you know, so um, it's really important to me to discover what each person's indivi individual strengths are, first of all. And then, you know, there, there are always, there's always repertoire, there's always projects where, you know, the weaknesses may show less, but the strengths can really shine. And that's great. I think there's like, the students need to, need to know and discover about themselves wh where they're really special. And all of them have something where they're really special. All of, all of the students. So, and then the weaknesses, um, yeah, weaknesses are hard. I think, um, you know, my husband's very wise teacher says that, so, I mean, so sometimes the problem is that the weaknesses are the things that are the hardest to overcome. I mean, otherwise it wouldn't be that weakness for so long. You know, it's the things that are really like, you know, sometimes I, I, I mean, it's, it's, it's funny, but I feel like there's this one little thing that separates that student from literally greatness, <laughs> but sometimes that one, little thing is really hard so i try to make it clear to them that you know that's how it is it's like really hard to overcome but if they want to get to a very clear next step that's what they need to do um i try you know both the tough and the supportive approach and see what works um whatever i do I try not to destroy you know because that's been done to me a lot and you know, I don't want students in therapy, you know, <laughs> so it's a waste of time. So, um, and it's also not, it's not objective. You know, the, the hardest thing about destructive teaching is that it's presented to you as if this is the objective way of looking at you. Does that make sense? Like you're objectively bad. Mm -hmm. you're... No, I mean, there's like, again, there's, you know, some weakness that needs to be addressed, but that doesn't make you as a person worthless or without the future. So, so I, as much as I can, as much as I try to be aware of myself, I try never to do that. Hmm. What about piano students who come to you, they want to study piano, but you know from the very beginning that 
they will not be pianists. I tell them. You tell them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's what what I really like about you know our school and no FSU is is the mm. same is um, that uh, so usually those kinds of students are not going to be graduate students. But by the time they're graduate students, they've sort of figured things out, and also by the time they're graduate students, the kind of window to pivot is not not that big. So if it's undergraduate students, um, it's usually um, so we have a number of degrees, you know, and it's usually. The performance degree where they so it's not that the performance degree is harder and the other degrees are like easier or not as good or something it's just that for the performance degree they should have started earlier so the other degrees like music education music therapy mm -hmm. a lot of the the knowledge that they need in those degrees actually sort of starts in college so if they're really diligent really hard working they can take all of that coursework and they can build it into you know something really wonderful um some People, you know, with the performance, I just ask them, so what do you want to do? And if, if there's something that I feel like is really not going to happen, I tell them. Mm. Not just like, you know, small chance if they work really hard, but, but really not going to happen, then I tell them. Right. Jihei, any more questions? Oh, that was we great. We are way over time. <laughs> <laughs> we are, but it's nice talking to you guys. <laughs> Next time we should do it with a you glass of, so. I don't know, wine or coffee or something. <laughs> So thank you, thank you so much for being with us. And also, we were with uh, Lisa Sipanova, a uh, great pianist, teacher, uh, artist. You know, and uh, uh, if you were not uh, here for the whole time, this will be on YouTube on the Prague Piano uh, Piano YouTube channel. You can watch it, watch it anytime. Yeah. Lisa, thank you so much. G8, thank, thank you. you. I'm a big fan, really. I oh, look up. I'm a fan of the two of you. It's just so great to to have as, this as a yeah, triangle. <laughs> Same here. All right. Thank you, guys. Okay. Thanks, Thanks for you. having me. Thank you. Good night. Have a good night. Bye.